Good morning. I know I say this every week, but it still amazes me how God works with me. And he's usually got to use a pretty good stick to get my attention or a pretty good club to get my attention. And as I was preparing for the message this week, I kept thinking, ain't no way this will fit in. But somehow it kept coming together and it did. And then I come up here this morning and the first song we said, sang is about believing. About believing. I've entitled my message this morning does God really mean what He says? Now think about it. Before you answer too quickly, does God really, without a doubt, really mean what He says in Scripture? And it's going to fall back on to believe. No matter how we say it, how we sing it, it's putting trust in God. But you have to answer for yourself. Does God really mean what he says? And if you say yes, do you believe it? Really believe it. This is not the opening scripture, bless you, Grover. This is not the opening scripture that I had chosen for this morning, but about 10 minutes before we left the house, I read this or heard this scripture given by Franklin Graham. And I thought, wow, you talk about getting my attention. I think this really got it. It's taken from 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For to this sort are they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin led away by divers' lust, every learning, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Does that touch on anything today that you see or hear or read? That was written I don't know, not too long after Christ's death. That's 2,000 years ago. How is that possible that I think it hits the nail right on the head today? today. How is it possible 
that that could have been foreseen for today. Do you really believe that God means what he says? To our shame, in today's society, the Bible is not revered like it once was, even in my time. God's word seems to fall on deaf ears more so as each day passes. The Bible is, if it's picked up, if it's read, it's questioned. The Word of God is questioned. It's disbelieved. It's scorned. There's an attempt to try to explain it away. The Bible in today's society is being reinterpreted to fit our lifestyle in the way we believe. The Bible today in our society is ignored. And you know what's really so sad about that? That's all taking place within the church today. I don't throw rocks at me. Stop and think a minute and you'll realize that it is. Take our denomination as an example. We are drifting. We are re-explaining. We are making the Bible or attempting to make the Bible fit our lives, our situation, the way we want it to be and to say what we want it to say. People, it's happening within the church. Imagine what's happening outside the church. Second Timothy 3, just give us an insight of some of the things that they said would happen. That time would come to pass, and that time is now. How did we get so far from trusting God, moving Him out of our schools, our homes, our government, and out of our church in our lifetime? This isn't something we inherited. This is something we are witnessing today. How have we sunk so low? How have we drifted so far away? When Jesus cleared the temple and threw out the money changers, he told them, you've taken my father's house, which is a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. And how many times have we, have, have we read that and cheered and say, Yay, Jesus, you're really doing it right. Keep going. But today, there's churches that are no more or little more than just a social gathering place. There's churches that have a total country club atmosphere about them. There's churches today that are a gossip center more than a house of prayer. There's churches today that I'm okay, you're, you're okay, is their theology. And that's just their meeting house. Churches today celebrate man as a main focal point and many times don't mention God at all when he should be the focal point. There's churches today that are set up entirely so we can bring our pets to church because they're just like family. Everything is oriented 
around the family pets. I visited the church once that they welcomed us at the door, glad we came. And we were welcome to bring in our laptops to use during church service. There were people there with their breakfast meals and their coffees, enjoying that during church service. Video games were being played. Some people were in their pajamas or their very knock-around leisure clothes. Walkmans with earbuds were a common sight. A lot of earphones, cell phones were being used all in the sanctuary, as long as you came to church. That's what's counted. I wonder what Jesus would have done if he'd have walked in a church like that today. Do we believe in our churches today? In really now, really. Do we believe there's a heaven and do we believe there's a hell? Or is it just something that's written down here to make it interesting, to grab our attention, and to scare our kids with? Do we really believe in a heaven and a hell? And while we're on the subject of Aston, do we believe? Just how much truth is in the scripture verses from the book of Matthew where it says, Enter thou good and faithful servant, or depart from me. I never knew you. We as good church people like to hear the good, good things and too many times we don't really consider the other side of the coin. Just how much, how deep, how strong, how committed is our belief in what the Bible says. <clears throat> does, does God say what he means? Does he mean what he says? In 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture. I did a sermon here, I know I did it one time, where a young minister asked his conger, told his congregation he wanted to please them and he'd do whatever it was required to do that. And as the congregation come up and said, don't preach on hell or damnation or tithing and so many things, the pastor tore it out of his Bible. And what was left when everyone was pleased and satisfied, the things were removed that offended him. What was left was in the beginning, Jesus wept. Amen. No one disputed that. I can believe that. In the beginning, Jesus wept. Amen. But what about everything that's in between and that's mingled in with that? Did God really mean what he said? Not just the scriptures we like and not just the scriptures that make us look good but all the scriptures did God really mean to say what he said let's look and see if God can back up what he said and if he can that'll give validity to this whole book we call the Bible. 
if God cannot back up and does not back up what he said, then there's room for doubt and there's room for question and there's room for not believing. In Genesis, and we were just studying this the other night, in Genesis, the second chapter, verses 16 and 17, God is telling Adam, everything in the garden is for you. All the fruits of the trees, you're welcome to eat. They're good for you and help yourself. But don't touch the fruit of the tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is yours, but don't touch that. Don't eat that because the day you do, you'll surely die. In Genesis, the third chapter, verse 6, Satan was talking to Eve about what God really meant and what he didn't mean. And as Eve looked on the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she saw that it looked good and she took it and ate of it and gave it to her husband, Adam, to eat. In Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19, God cursed the serpent for deceiving Eve. God put a curse on Eve, on woman, through the rest of existence here on earth to the point that she should suffer great pain in childbirth. God put a curse on the land and said it would grow thorns and thistles forever. And God put a curse on Adam and said that he would earn his bread, earn his keep by the sweat of his brow. He was no longer allowed in the garden to eat freely, get hungry, just reach up and pluck. Anytime. Now he had to work for his substance. Now he had to toil. God said, when you eat, you'll surely die. He was talking the spiritual death, but also came along with it was the physical death. Man was made to be eternal with God. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses five through seven, God looked down from heaven and said, I am sad, I'm disheartened, I regret making man. He has turned so evil and everything imaginable in his mind he is doing. He said, I will destroy man that I created and everything on the earth that I created. In there, in that story, he told Noah to build a boat. A hundred years later, Noah had finished his task, built a boat, and in Genesis, in Genesis 7 and 4, God approaches Noah and said, get everything in the ark, and you and your family, because in seven days I will cause it to rain, day and night for 40 days, so get in. And seven days later, Genesis 7, 21, it began to rain, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The earth opened up and the waters came forth, all the springs flooded the earth and killed everything that was not inside 
of the ark. Does God mean what he says? In Genesis, the 18th chapter, two messengers from God appear before Abraham or Abram. And let it be known, and the Bible is sketchy, but it's still plain enough for me to understand, so you should have no trouble at all. But the messengers let it be known that Sodom and Gomorrah was in deep trouble. Abram talked with them, discussed with them, tried to make concessions for Sodom and Gomorrah, and it insinuates that he is discussing this with God, but when you're discussing with a matter, messenger from the Lord you're discussing with him and he got to the point where he said if there's 50 people will you spare it if there's 40 30 10 it didn't happen it didn't happen God told Lot I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah get your family you and your family and leave and go to the hills now. Don't look back. God rained fire and brimstone from heaven and brought destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah. But on the journey in fleeing, Lot and his family, Lot's wife couldn't bear it. She turned around to look back and instantly, she was turned into a pillar of salt. God said, don't look back. Does God mean what he says? Do you believe? Do you believe? The Ark of the Covenant was told how to be built by God. The Ark of the Covenant was covered with gold. A lot of different things were made, dimensions. But the only way to carry it is they put four rings, one on each corner of the Ark of the Covenant. And there were big staves or staffs, poles, that run through those rings. And the sons of Kohath were designated as the bearers of the Ark of the covenant. This was initiated by God. Only they could bear the Ark of the Covenant. And it was strongly instructed that they should never touch it. Because if they did, they would die. That's taken from Numbers 4. And 15. In Numbers 6, 6 and 7, the ark was being transported back to its place that it belonged in a way that wasn't recommended or instructed by God. And it was on a cart drawn by oxen. And as it was being transported, Something shifted, maybe the wheel run over a stone, but the ark started to teeter. Possibility of falling. One of the sons of Koath reached up to steady it, to keep it from falling, and instantly God took his life on the spot. Sounds unfair, doesn't it? You can't read anything good into that, can you? Here is a man that wants to help and do right in the eyes of God. And God takes his life on the spot. He didn't take it. He didn't take his life for what he did. God took his life 
because God said, do not touch. And Uzzah reached up and touched the ark. Does God really mean what he says? Ask yourself that question. In Genesis, the 18th chapter, verse 14, Abram and Sarah were visited by a messenger from God and said that they would bear a child. They're 9,900 years old. And they're going to bear a son that's going to be a father of nations. Many, many nations. Offspring can't be counted. In Genesis 21, verse 2, Sarah became pregnant. In Acts, the first chapter, verses four and five, this is Jesus speaking after the crucifixion, after he had risen from the dead. He's speaking to those gathered in a meeting place, and he had been with them, been seen by them for 40 days already, so it's at least 40 days after he arose. He said, but wait for the promise of the Father which ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Then in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, it says this, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it blew and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Does God really mean what he says? In Exodus, the 12th chapter, verses 7, 13, and 23, God is telling the people as they're preparing to leave Egypt, assuming the night before, he tells them to slaughter a lamb that they're to eat and take the blood and paint it on the doorpost and the lintel above the door is a sign of Passover because God said he was going to kill the firstborn of every man and every animal in Egypt on that night. Can you imagine that? And he said, paint the door with the blood. And in verse in 13, he said, that is so, when I see it, no harm will come to you. And in verse 23, it says that they did that. They stayed in the house. They painted the blood where it was. They dined on the lamb as they were instructed. They did not go out. In Exodus 12, Verse 29, at the stroke of midnight, the angel of death went through the land of Egypt and slew every firstborn child of man in the entire land of Egypt and the firstborn of every animal in the land of Egypt. But when it saw the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, of the house. It passed over 
so no harm came to the people within. Does God really mean what he says? I think that pretty much sums it up that he does. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? I mean, I grew up like I'm sure you did with Bible stories about the ark, about King David, about Moses, about the parting of the Red Sea and so forth. You learn from a young age the Bible stories. And as you got older, hopefully, you learn more in depth of what it said. But where you sit today, are those just stories that you learned yesteryear? Or do you honestly, truly believe them? Think about it. There can't be a maybe, and there can't be, and I don't know, I'm not sure. Do you believe that what God says, He means, and that what He says, He will do? So why is the church today in such a mess? Why are we running helter-skelter Believing this, not believing that, trying to explain away the goodness, trying to make right the evilness that's in our hearts and in our midst. Why are we trying to fill the pews with people instead of trying to fill the kingdom of God with souls? Why are we trying to fill the coffers of the church with dollars instead of trying to win the souls and hearts of man to God. That's what we're supposed to be doing as a church. Now maybe, maybe you're thinking that could be true, but it's not true here at Oakdale. Well, let me ask you this question. God says that we're supposed to pray. The Bible says that we're supposed to pray. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 it says, pray without ceasing. In Luke 18 and 1 it says to always be in prayer. In Romans 12, 12, it says to be instant in prayer. Colossians 4, verse 2, pray constantly. Ephesians 6 and 18, it says praying in the Spirit always with perseverance and supplication. Yet how many of us reserve our prayers, our prayers, for when company comes? Or for when we're dining out and in public? Or when we come to church? I don't think that's God's definition of praying without ceasing, ceasing or be instant in prayer, praying always and constantly, consistently with supplication and perseverance. Do you? Do you? Now we like to think we're good and we don't like when someone stands up here and says we got some shortcomings. But I want to tell you this. We do have shortcomings. We do have shortcomings, beginning with me. Beginning with me. We have trouble, and we need to go here to straighten it out. 
We need to quit talking and start walking. We need to quit hoping and start believing. We need to stop guessing and start having faith. Why is it so hard for people to pray? And that's just one thing I will pick on today because it seems to be prevalent in many churches. Is it because of fear of speaking in public? Is it because we don't know how to pray? Is it that maybe we would be embarrassed for saying the wrong thing in prayer? Well, let me tell you something. In about 1980, give or take a year, we were having a meeting at our church down Sunnyside. And after the meeting, I was asked to lead in the closing or dismissing prayer. Duh. I'd never done that before. I'd only been a Christian a little over maybe two years, if that long. <clears throat> I didn't know how to pray. I was embarrassed. I stood there totally dumbfounded for what seemed like an eternity with my mouth open and nothing coming out. Now you say, how's that possible? I stand up here and I can go on and on and on. But I'm telling you the truth. I was petrified. A little nine or ten year old girl, my daughter, reached up and took me by the hand and said, Daddy, I'll pray for you. I want you to know right now, as honest as I can be, I don't remember anything, any words, content of her prayer that night. But I do know it was the most beautiful prayer I have ever heard in my life. And it came from a little child to rescue her daddy. You know what she did? She just, she didn't say, Oh God! Oh great divine heavenly Father! She just simply talked to God that night. She just simply talked to him like a little girl you would expect would. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. To this day, I have to confess, I still don't know how to pray. But I do know how to talk to God. And sometimes it's with tears in my eyes. Sometimes it's when my heart is racing. Sometimes it's because I love something or someone so much and I feel pain and distress. Sometimes it's when I'm happy and can't hardly constrain myself and just want to say thank you. But he doesn't hear the words from me, oh God. He hears me talking to him. And I believe, I don't know if you do or not, but I believe he hears me. Because his word says he will. The little girl taught me, the teacher of her, how to talk with God. 
If you have trouble, try it sometime. Just try it sometime. God won't make you red-faced. He won't make you feel like you're insignificant. He won't brush you off like he's got no time for you. He'll listen. Just talk to God. In Isaiah, the 65th chapter, verse 24, this is what the scripture says concerning God. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Matthew 7 and 7. Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. You notice there before each one of them, there was something that we have to do. And then it says, shall, definitely, positively, without a doubt. Not maybe, and, if, but, or, later. It says, shall. Does God really mean what he says? In the Matthew 21, verse 22, and Mark 11, verse 24, Matthew 8, 13, Matthew 9, 29, Luke 17, verse 19, and Mark 5 and 34, they all speak of believing and then receiving not the other way around. Believe and receive. Jesus said in 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes at the Father but by me. Contrary to what you hear or read or see today, there is no other alternative, duplicate, may be possible way except through Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God in heaven. That is the only way. And Jesus said in John 3 and 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He said in John 12 and 14, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater things he shall do also, because I am going to my Father. Does God mean what he says today? If you have any doubts in your mind, about what God says, what he means, his power, can he do what he has said he will do? Ask the man who was given back his sight. Ask the parents of the little girl that was raised from the dead. Ask Martha and Mary as they saw their brother emerge from the tomb. Ask the centurion or the leper, or the woman with the issue of blood, if you have any doubts. Ask the lame man. Ask the lunatic. Ask me. Ask me. Does God mean what he says? We're facing some tough times in our lives today the way we live, the way we used to live, the way things are maybe going to have to be. When will it all end? When will it all end? Where do we turn to 
and for the answers that we're seeking today. Who are we supposed to believe? Who has the right answers? The doctors, maybe? The scientists? The Democrats? The Republicans? Our government as a whole? Billionaire governors? Does athletes have all the answers? Or movie stars? Or ethnic groups that are making the news today? Who? Where do we turn? Who do we ask? All these people that I just mentioned have a personal agenda, something to gain and by their actions. And the chances of them knowing you by name is slim to none at the best. God in heaven knows you by name, knows you by the number of hairs on your head, knew you before you was born. He doesn't have a personal agenda. He just loves you. He loves me that much. Who can you trust? Not me. I'll let you down. No doubt, I'll let you down. Grover, he's too busy. He's got too much on his plate right now. My wife, Margie, she's got her hands full with me. She doesn't want to take on any other hard jobs. Shelby? She's ridiculously in love. She doesn't have that much time to commit. Who do we turn to? Who's got the answer? Right here. It's not this. It's not this. It's this. There is the answer. Here is the answer. Why don't we go to it more often? What about you today? Do you believe that God really means what he says? About 700 years before Jesus was even born, give or take 40 or 50. God said it would happen through the seed of Jesse. God said Jesus would be born through the seed of Jesse. Look it up, Isaiah 11, 1 to 10. About 700 years before Jesus was born, God said how he would die. Isaiah 7 and 14, Luke 1 and 24, and Luke 2 and 7 confirms both of those. Also Luke 22, 32, and Luke 34, 6. Does God mean what he says? Well, I'm going to put myself on the chopping block and say only a total, complete fool would deny that God really means what he says. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 he says this, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up 
with him in the, the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The scriptures I've given you today all are backed up by the word of God. Everyone has God's promise and God's fulfillment. God's statement and his action or reaction to it. Lacking none. That scripture that I just read, why would I think any different than God will see that through? That's a promise to me and to you. If we will believe, if we still are walking and breathing here today, and he splits the eastern sky and returns, I believe that I'll meet him in the clouds, in the air, and I'll be with him forever. What about you? Do you truly, honestly believe that God really means what he says? If you don't, if you have any reservation at all about that, you can make it right today at the altar of God. And would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for your promises and the fulfillment of those promises. Thank you, Lord, that the only reason you pester us so much is because you love us so much. And thank you, God, that the promises are still to come of Jesus' return and our life eternal with you. So I pray, God, that if we don't have it right today, we will make it right today. I ask, Lord, that you start working on us, our minds and our actions, us in the church first, and then spreading out, allowing us to also reach others to bring them in the church, into the body, of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your love. And I pray, Lord, that we all believe, believe, believe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.